Welcome to SNC's podcast series, SNC Critical Insights. My name is Judd Littleton, and I'm a partner in the litigation group and co head of the firm's appellate practice. I'm here with my partner, Julia Malkina. Today, we are continuing our series of podcast supplements to SNC's Supreme Court Business Review, our summary of the decisions from this past term that are most relevant to businesses. You can find the Supreme Court Business Review, as well as all of our podcast episodes once they're released, on SNC's website at www.solcrom.com. In this episode, Joe Newhouse and Andrew Finn, the heads of SNC's arbitration practice, are joining us to discuss two recent arbitration developments at the Supreme Court. First, Joe and Andrew will discuss the Supreme Court's recent decision in GE Energy Power Conversion France SAS Corporation versus Autocompu Stainless USA LLC. This decision was covered in the Supreme Court Business Review. Then, Joe and Andrew will talk with us about the grant of certiorari in Henry Schein Inc. versus Archer & White Sales Inc. If that case sounds familiar to you, it may be because the Supreme Court already issued a decision in the Shine case back in the October 2018 term. So let's start with the GE Energy case. In a unanimous decision reversing the 11th Circuit, the Supreme Court ruled that the New York Convention, which is the core international treaty on enforcement of arbitral awards, permits a non-signatory to an arbitration agreement to compel arbitration based on the doctrine of equitable estoppel. Justice Thomas wrote the opinion for the court, and Justice Sotomayor wrote a separate concurrence. Joe, can you tell us a little bit more about the issue in the case? Thanks, Judge. Julia, for those not familiar with it, the New York Convention on the Recognition and Enforcement of Foreign Arbitral Awards calls for courts of participating countries to enforce not just international arbitration awards, but also international arbitral agreements. In the U.S., the convention basically applies when the case involves a non-U.S. citizen. Over 150 countries are parties to the convention. It has been implemented in the U.S. by Chapter 2 of the Federal Arbitration Act. And that is the source of the problems that led to the decision in GE Energy. The Federal Arbitration Act, that is the FAA, has separate chapters for domestic arbitration, dealt with in Chapter 1, and international arbitrations, covered by an applicable treaty, which are dealt with in Chapters 2 and 3. Chapter 2 incorporates the terms of the New York Convention and says that Chapter 1 also applies to convention awards and agreements unless the provisions of Chapter 1 conflict with the terms of the convention. Chapter 1 of the FAA had previously been interpreted under U.S. common law estoppel doctrines to allow non-signatories to an arbitration agreement to compel signatories to arbitrate in certain circumstances. So the issue before the Supreme Court was whether the New York Convention, which governs international arbitration, is in conflict with Chapter 1 of the FAA, which allows the use of common law doctrines like equitable estoppel in domestic arbitrations. That's right. The Supreme Court ruled that the New York Convention does not conflict with and thus permits application of U.S. equitable estoppel doctrines to allow non-signatories to enforce arbitration agreements. Although it was a unanimous decision, the Supreme Court granted cert to resolve a circuit split. The Ninth and Eleventh Circuits had previously said, no, a non-signatory can't compel arbitration in a case governed by the New York Convention, whereas the First and Fourth Circuits had said, sure, go ahead. Interesting. And a square 2-2 split. Andrew, how did the GE Energy case arise in the first place? The situation was, in some respects, pretty typical in a lot of industries. The case involved contracts to build and install cold rolling mills for steel in a manufacturing plant in Alabama. The plant owner was a U.S. affiliate of ThyssenKrupp, but by the time of the lawsuit, the plant was owned by another steel manufacturer, Antetokounmpo. ThyssenKrupp and later Antetokounmpo hired FL Industries as its general contractor for the project. The construction contracts between Antetokounmpo and the general contractor, FL Industries, contained an arbitration clause providing for arbitration of, quote, all disputes arising between both parties in connection with or in performance of the contract. That language is fairly typical, but the clause was a bit unusual because the term parties was defined to include subcontractors, 
So it was plain that the clause envisioned that subcontractors might be part of any arbitration. We'll come back to that when we talk about Justice Sotomayor's concurrence. So the general contractor entered into a subcontract with GE Energy to provide the motors needed to power the coal rolling mills. There was no direct contract between Ontakumbu and GE Energy. The dispute arose when the GE Motors allegedly failed and Ontakumbu, the plant owner, sued GE Energy directly as the subcontractor in Alabama State Court asserting negligence and product liability claims. There was no direct arbitration clause between them, but GE Energy nevertheless removed the case to federal court and sought to compel arbitration against Ontakumbu, relying on the arbitration clause in its contracts with the general contractor, uh, FL Industries, and the doctrine of equitable estoppel. So what exactly was GE Energy's argument for how it could enforce the terms of the contract under the doctrine of equitable estoppel? Well, the, the principle behind equitable estoppel is that a party that is relying on one aspect of an agreement to its benefit should be estopped or prevented from denying the applicability of the rest of the agreement. Since Antakumbu was relying in part on GE Energy's contractual duties under the subcontract with the general contractor to bring its claims, GE Energy argued that Antakumbu should be stopped from denying the applicability of the arbitration provision. So, Joe, what was the Supreme Court's reasoning for finding that the New York Convention permits the application of U.S. estoppel doctrines? Antakumbu argued that Chapter 2 of the FAA required that any arbitration agreement be signed by the parties to be enforceable. The logic of the argument was based on the New York Convention's language, which says that contracting states will recognize, quote, an agreement in writing. And then the convention contains a definition. The term agreement in writing shall include an arbitral clause signed by the parties, is the definition. So you might think it pretty clear the fact that the New York Convention says the term agreement in writing includes clauses signed by the party does not mean that it requires a signed writing. The Supreme Court did not reach that question of the interpretation of the convention. Instead, the court got to the same place in a different way. It held that the convention merely required agreements in writing to be enforced when one of the parties requests referral to arbitration. But, Justice Thomas wrote, the convention, quote, does not restrict contracting states from applying domestic law to refer to parties to arbitration in other circumstances. It, quote, does not state that arbitration agreements should be enforced only in the identified circumstances. As a result, he said, contracting states could use domestic doctrines to, as he put it, fill gaps in the convention. And by the way, I think that term gap-filling language is a catchy phrase, the kind of thing you're going to see in numerous briefs in arbitration cases over the next decade or more dealing with the interaction between Article 1 and Article 2 of the FAA. So one additional point on this case to note is that although the Supreme Court based its decision on the text of the treaty, it also looked to the negotiation and drafting history of the treaty, which is pretty standard. The court said the drafting history supported its idea that Article 2 just sets a baseline. But interestingly, Joe, the court also looked to evidence of the post-ratification understanding of other signatory nations. The court referred to a treatise, a well-known book by Gary Bourne, that listed cases from numerous countries that permit enforcement of arbitration agreements by entities that did not sign the arbitration agreement. And it even looked to a U.N. document recommending a non-exclusive interpretation of the writing requirement in the convention. There was a time when it was controversial as to whether the Supreme Court should look to the decisions of other countries in deciding cases. That's no longer the case, apparently, at least not in treaty cases. So, Joe, I think you made a guess as to how this case would come out when you previewed it in a podcast with Andrew last summer. How'd you do? Well. I did it again. I did predict that the court would allow foreign subcontractors to invoke the doctrines in a situation like this. I didn't get that it would be unanimous, but I got the result right. Justice Sotomayor's concurrence does suggest a potential limitation that could narrow the applicability of the doctrine of equitable estoppel. What do you make of the concurrence? 
interesting. Justice Sotomayor said that the application of domestic doctrines, such as equitable estoppel, quote, must be rooted in the principle of consent to arbitrate. In this case, where the contract specifically envisioned subcontractors, there is a strong case for finding that the signatory had consented to arbitrate with a subcontractor. But apparently, some courts have allowed non-signatories to force arbitration of claims wholly unconnected to the agreement. Justice Sotomayor then put down a kind of marker that she, at least, would require a showing that the signatory, in fact, consented to arbitrate the dispute with the particular non-signatory in question. One other point, this opinion does not address circumstances where a signatory seeks to compel a non-signatory to arbitrate a dispute. That can sometimes happen. Think of alter ego cases where the alter ego has not signed the arbitration agreement but may be compelled to arbitrate. But those cases raise different questions altogether. So, Andrew, any takeaways in light of this decision for parties drafting an agreement with an arbitration clause? Absolutely. When including an arbitration clause in an international contractual agreement or considering disputes related to an arbitration clause, it's often important to consider not only the governing law of the contracts, but also the arbitral law of the seat of arbitration. That is the place you agree to arbitrate any claims. Uh, In this case, it was the United States. Therefore, U.S. common law doctrines could apply. And you also have to think about where any award is likely to be enforced. But you usually will not want to rely on doctrines like equitable estoppel to figure out where one can sue. That's a kind of last resort. When a transaction is likely to involve multiple related contracts and subcontracts with different parties, it's important to think through how you might get related to disputes with all interested parties into a single forum. We'll often try to include arbitration clauses in all the related agreements and subcontracts at issue, making sure they are compatible and including express provisions for consolidation of the related arbitrations. Doing that sounds like it would cut down on gating issues and, importantly, provide predictability for the parties as to dispute resolution. To switch gears to another notable arbitration development, Andrew, why is the Shine case back to the Supreme Court? Well, this is a bit of a case for arbitration geeks. It's about who decides, the court or arbitrators, whether the arbitrators have jurisdiction over a case. That's often referred to in arbitration cases as the question of arbitrability of a claim. The background rule promulgated by the Supreme Court in a case called first options is that courts generally get to decide the threshold issue of whether a claim is subject to arbitration unless the parties have provided, quote, clear and unmistakable evidence they wanted the arbitrator to decide that question. The thought was that most people would not want the arbitrator to decide because arbitrators have a vested interest in coming out in favor of their own jurisdiction. But that thought has collided with the reality that most arbitration rules go to great lengths to try to make sure the entire dispute of parties can stay before the arbitrators and to minimize court involvement. So default rules of most used arbitral institutions almost universally say that the arbitrator has power to decide his or her own jurisdiction. And the courts have pretty much uniformly gone along, saying that that kind of clause provides just the clear and unmistakable evidence that first options call for. That all becomes important with respect to what the Shine case is not about, which we'll come to. As discussed in last year's Supreme Court Business Review, the first time around in January 2019, the Supreme Court addressed whether When a set of rules provided that arbitrators have the power to decide their own jurisdiction, a court could decide the question if the decision on that question was essentially really easy. Uh, That was the so-called wholly groundless exception that some courts have recognized. And it went that if the argument for arbitration was wholly groundless, could a court that was faced with a motion to compel arbitration just say, no, this dispute is not subject to arbitration? In January 2019, the Supreme Court said, no, we really meant it. If the arbitration clause gives questions about the interpretation of the scope of the clause to the arbitrator, a court can't decide the issue just because it seems open and shut. 
the Supreme Court then remanded the case because the Fifth Circuit hadn't yet determined whether the agreement had issued, in fact, did delegate the threshold arbitrability question to the arbitrator. I do remember that from last year's Supreme Court Business Review. So, Joe, what happened on remand? So the Fifth Circuit said that even though the clause incorporated the AAA rules, which has a pretty standard, the arbitrator can decide kind of clause, the clause still allowed the court to decide the jurisdiction issue. Thinking was, the arbitration clause in the Shine contract had a carve-out for actions seeking injunctive relief, among other things. The clause referred all disputes to arising under the agreement to arbitration, quote, except for actions seeking injunctive relief. The Fifth Circuit found that the plain language of that arbitration clause didn't incorporate the AAA rules with respect to those disputes seeking injunctive relief. Therefore, the Fifth Circuit said, you couldn't say that the agreement evinced clear and unmistakable evidence of an intent to delegate arbitrability questions to the arbitrators. As a result, the court said it was entitled to decide that question, and lo and behold, it found that the dispute in question was not arbitrable. The carve-out excluded any, quote, action seeking injunctive relief, not just injunctive relief claims, for example. And Archer and White had sought both damages and injunctive relief, so the case belonged in court, said the, the court, said the Fifth Circuit. So that's the decision Shine is challenging in its second cert petition, which the Supreme Court just granted. The question presented is whether the existence of a carve-out provision negates an otherwise clear and unmistakable delegation of arbitrability. Last time, Professor George Berman of Columbia Law School authored an amicus brief that got significant attention in arbitration circles. What was that brief about? Well, in his amicus brief in Shine 1, Berman addressed the issue we mentioned earlier, on which all circuits have agreed that when a contract incorporates arbitration rules that provide arbitrators with the power to decide their own jurisdiction, that constitutes clear and unmistakable evidence that the parties delegated the power to decide questions of arbitrability to the arbitrators. Now, Berman is the chief reporter on the arbitration law restatement that has just been completed. He disagrees with all the courts, arguing, among other things, that the rules merely ensure that an arbitrator does not have to stop a case if a jurisdictional issue arises. But the Supreme Court sidestepped the issue in Shine 1, expressing no view on whether the agreement at issue delegated the arbitrability question to an arbitrator. In Shine 2, this time around, Archer and White actually filed a cross-petition presenting this question, asking the court to decide that question, and Berman filed another amicus brief in support. But the Supreme Court ducked the issue again and denied the cross-petition. Must have been very disappointing for Professor Berman and the other arbitration geeks who have been dying for the court to address this issue. So, Joe, do you want to continue your streak and make a prediction for Shine 2? Well, here we go. Okay, there's more or less a circuit split on this issue. Uh, the Ninth Circuit has concluded that a carve-out provision in an arbitration agreement for certain disputes does not negate a clear and unmistakable delegation of arbitrability. Its reasoning is that when a tribunal decides that a claim falls within the scope of a carve-out provision, it necessarily decides arbitrability. So the case that the matter has to go to the arbitrators. Second Circuit, on the other hand, has found that the presence of a carve-out provision, quote, delays application of AAA rules until a decision is made as to whether a question does or does not fall within the intended scope of arbitration. Fifth Circuit sided with the second. So this is a tough one, given how narrow the issue is. But I think the Supreme Court is going to, drumroll please, affirm, based on the precise wording of the clause at issue. Because the clause referred all disputes, except those seeking injunctive relief, to the arbitrators, the parties did not clearly and unmistakably refer the question of jurisdiction over a claim for injunctive relief to the arbitrators. I think, though, the decision may not provide much guidance for other cases because it's going to turn, I predict, very much on the precise wording of the clause in this case. We'll need to wait until next year to see how you did, Joe. With two trips to the Supreme Court, how old is this case? Well, this the complaint in this case was filed on August 31st, 2012, so I'm afraid this is not a model for swift justice. The parties still don't even know for sure, who will decide whether their lawsuit should be heard 
by a court or by arbitrators. Thank you, Andrew. And thank you, Joe. That's all the time we have for today. Thank you for listening to our Supreme Court Business Review podcast series. For more information about our practice, please visit us on the web at www.solcrom.com. Thanks again. Thank you.